Welcome everyone. Hello, it's good to see you. Really take a minute to establish a posture that feels comfortable. Sitting or reclining, whatever you choose. Just checking in about what's needed, maybe a blanket would feel nice. It's a beautiful act of generosity to actually check in with the body, just to see what's needed to be comfortable enough to practice. And once we've made our final adjustments, we can accept, fully accept the body on the body's terms. The body is its own force of nature. All of the interconnected systems. We can certainly learn how to take care of the body skillfully. And we always balance our efforts with some surrender. Surrender to this force of nature that is the body. And finding your own way to connection with the body. You might notice the warmth or the coolness here.
You might feel pressure or heaviness. or even pain. And eventually we can find our way to the breath. The expansion of the inhale. the release of the exhale. No need to define the breath. Or limit the breath by imposing our ideas onto the breath. We can just practice the generosity of allowing the breath its own expansion into itself. And it might not be that easy or natural even. It might not feel that natural too. Just allow. Allow the breath to be itself. But the journey is so beautiful. We 
We get to use our life energy. Right here in this very ordinary way. Cultivating this very inclusive heart, this inclusive, expansive way of being. Fully accepting the breath and the body just the way they are. And seeing clearly how interconnected Breath is with all of life. Any thought or emotion, any amount of pushing or pulling, wanting, not wanting, The breath is influenced by all of it. And each emotion, each thought, each expression of the heart is also influenced by this extraordinary web of conditions. So there's no reason to resist breath. There's no reason to resist life. There's no reason to resist any part of our being. This full expression of a human life right here has arisen lawfully. interdependent May this wisdom support our heart settling 
more and more fully with every breath. Right here into our experience.
And for the last few minutes, I'd like to invite us to reflect on the five remembrances. And I'll read them, each of them to you, for us. And you can just receive them. Don't even need to try to make sense of them or really think about them. Just receive them into your heart and see what moves there. I am of the nature to grow old. There's no way to escape growing old. I am of the nature to sicken. There is no way to escape sickness. I am of the nature to die. There is no way to escape death. All that is dear to me and everyone I love are of the nature to change. There is no escape being separated from them. My actions are my closest companions. I am the beneficiary of my actions. My actions are the ground on which I stand. to invite us to open our eyes. And we're going to extend our practice a little with a bit of movement. So you can just, wherever you are, don't make special arrangements. I'm just making one little move here. You can just stand wherever you are.
And if standing isn't the right thing for your body and you feel more comfortable in a chair, it's okay to stay seated. But if you are able to stand, you just want to rest the hands on the belly. Just feel the body in the standing posture. I encourage any stale or stagnant energy to move. We're just gonna allow the feet to move back and forth, rocking a little side to side even. Just subtle movements. And taking a couple of deep breaths here. And dropping the arms. And just allowing the body to just sway, move, just how it wants to. Rotating the shoulders, bending, inviting the energy to move. And following your intuition as to what feels good and right. And we'll do some pelvic tilts, just standing, rocking the hips forward and back a few times. And then doing some circles with the trunk in both directions. And let's just shake it out a little bit. And finding some stillness when you're ready once more. And if you have glasses on, you can take them off. Put them in your pocket or on a table or something near. And we'll rub our arms, hands together a little, generate some more. And then resting our head in our hands, allowing the head to be held. And then with the fingertips, we're gonna massage the face. We'll start with the eyeballs and we're just making some gentle circles around the eyeballs. And then we'll get bigger with the circles and we'll go up and over the brow and down the cheekbone and up the bridge of the nose and down the forehead, down the cheeks and the chin, up the bridge of the nose again and down around the edges of the face. And then we'll go up the middle of the face, over the bridge of the nose, and down the back of the head. 
And then pausing here and just giving the neck a little massage. You can cross your hands and give the shoulders a little squeeze. Squeeze all the way down the arms. And with the fingers, we'll massage the ears. Just a little massage down the lobes, all around, giving a little tug on the lobes. And then if you'd like to, you can make some loose fists and we'll do a little pounding in the kidney area. And down the buttocks. And with an open hand, do a little rubbing in that area. Up the back. Down the buttocks, down the hips, and we'll go all the way down the legs, down the front of the legs and up the backs of the legs a couple of times. Just massaging, rubbing, and down the outside of the legs and up the inside of the legs a couple of times. A little more rubbing in the lower back area. Maybe even some rubbing on the belly, mixing of the energies. And then coming back to a basic standing posture, taking a couple of deep breaths, settling in, some slight movement to the body, just inviting the energy to be free. Not stagnant, moving, always moving. Loose shoulders, loose hips, free flowing energy. And you can find yourself back to your chair whenever you're ready. Thank you for your practice, everyone. It's nice to include a little movement regularly or at least occasionally in our practice. I, I don't know if you could feel it the way I do, but um, it feels like there's some movement Sometimes just a little bit of body movement can support the movement of energy in the heart. Yeah. And so let's, yeah, I appreciate being together. Look around the screens. Say hello to each other. Use the chat if you'd like to say hi. Hey, friends. If you'd like to share how you're doing in the chat, love to hear it and see some comments already. Looks like a lot of hellos to our friend Spruce. <laughs> Hope you're receiving all the love, Spruce. <laughs> if, if you'd like to just say one or two words about how you're doing now, that would be great to hear from some folks in the chat. So I'd like to 
share a few reflections tonight, and then spend most of the time in a question and response time. So it's nice to it's nice to do a little of both. And this this is a quote from the Buddha. He says, "Practitioners, this assembly or sangha." is free from idle chatter, devoid of idle chatter, and is established on pure heartwood. Such is this community of practitioners, such is this assembly. The sort of assembly that is worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respect, an incomparable field of merit for the world. Such is this community of practitioners such is this assembly. The sort of assembly to which a small gift when given becomes great and a great gift greater. Such is this community of practitioners, such is this assembly. The sort of assembly that that it is rare to see in the world. Such is this community of practitioners, such is this assembly. The sort of assembly that it would be worth traveling for leagues, taking along provisions in order to see. An assembly that is established on pure heartwood and really, you know, really goes to the heart of things. A community that knows to go to the heart of things. To let some of the superficiality fall away. Last week I spoke a little bit about refuge and continuing some of the reflections on refuge. In my own practice, I'd like to expand from there a little bit tonight. This is In Buddhism, we don't even know if we need to say that. As human beings who gather around some deep values, maybe that's a better way to say it. We find ways to continue to keep our practice, to keep some energy in our practice, to keep our hearts enlivened, to continue to seek goodness and find really skillful ways to be in community with each other. And so as I reflect on refuge, it seems to have taken me deeper and deeper into the the real beauty and the heart's desire to have a skillful and loving Sangha. One of the refuges, the three refuges, this quality of seeking, going for refuge, of continuing to be curious learner of what it means to be human is what we might call going for refuge. So refuge isn't a place that we land and know, it's an inquiry, which is what the path is all about, right? These teachings don't offer us answers, they offer us a path, a path that's walked. Like any path, it's often not perfect. It's not always straight or clean. Yeah, it involves adjusting and being nimble and this is the path that we're on and so as we go for refuge it's this willingness to keep 
being curious to keep being willing to adjust. And it's in this alive process of movement, the movement that we experience when we move the body, when we take deep breaths even, when we relax the shoulders, when we sit up a little straighter. It's here in this aliveness that we continue to be renewed in our practice. And so I feel like this is really important right now. We're all um, reckoning with the truth of our humanness individually and collectively in substantial ways. I don't even need to name all of the ways. But it can lead us to feeling tired or burnt out or overly energized. And so finding some stabilizing, steadying, efforting in order to return to what is good and beautiful and useful is so important. I don't know if some of you were, I know that some of you were there because I remember seeing you, but Jason Soul gave a wonderful talk last night. Jason is a activist. Jason is so much more than that. This big hearted human being who's had great dif- difficulties in his life and overcome so many challenges that were not his, but were born of this white supremacy culture that we live within, participate in. And somehow Jason emerged as this human being who is full of love and one of the messages that he carried forward last night was about our, about how we live with our deepest values to take care of each other. He gave that a word, he called it, well, he said he was talking about abolishing the police. And as that might sound, you know, like a big deal. He really broke it down in some very ordinary ways. Like it's just about really being there for each other. And we can do that in ordinary ways. So as we connect with this capacity to seek refuge in a beautiful sangha, we learn that we participate in creating that sangha in every moment in the quality of our presence, the quality of our awareness, in the acts, in the actions that we take. And not just in the physical actions, but in the you know, the, the ways that we share our love and care for each other by talking, by sending metta, by checking in, by just showing up and being here. It's a much different practice space when the quality of our presence isn't that sincere. But as I look out and even flip through the pages, you know, it almost brings me to tears. There's a lot of sincerity in the room. And a sincerity that we can appreciate and grow from. It's really important to remember that we are, as we are going for refuge as we are enlivening our practice moment by moment, finding the energy to keep seeking, we're actually participating in the creating of something. And so what we model for each other, how we show up for each other is a big part of that. We're impacted. And there's so many of you, so many of you that I know and many of you that I don't know that well,
But hopefully we're seeing, even in a simple moment like this, the impact of presence, like, oh, yeah, sincerity. That's really nice. And so much more. And one of the, the, the sort of fabric that connects Sangha, the fabric that supports this container that we are co-creating, this connection that we're co-creating is our capacity, our skillfulness, and our willingness to live an ethical life. So again, the precepts, sila, our integrity, and how we enliven the practice of integrity helps us feel as some sort of comfort in the room, even of people that we don't know that well can. It's not perfect because we come to our practice with our own experience and it's not easy. But a community that's alive with inquiry and recommitment is a community that can feel comfortable even when our conditioning leads us to believe that it's not possible. I still remember the words of my friend who came to Common Ground for the first time and they walked in the room and didn't see any any of their people there. And it was sort of heartbreaking. And so they went back to their teacher who lived in California and said, I don't know what to do. I really want to practice here. And this seems like a community that I can do that in, but I don't see any of my people and it's really uncomfortable. And their teacher said, well, you be that for someone else. And that was enough. That was enlivening enough for them to keep seeking like, oh, what does this community mean? What does it mean to be a community? What does it mean to show up for each other? How can I do that for someone else? And part of that practice is feeling into the heartbreak. It's hard not to feel like, oh, This is that easy, it's not that easy. And so this going for refuge, going to Sangha, going to the creation, going to the participation in our hearts and co-creating a community that we can feel supported by, feel like we are supporting, feel like we're responsible to and participating in. Is is really courageous. And uh, one of the supporting forces in my life has been ritual or devotion, some kind of devotional practice. So I wanted to get around to leaning into this part of the chapter that Kitty Sara was pointing to in this book that we're going through together, Listening to the Heart. And so beginning, sometimes beginning a sit with some kind of devotional practice, not necessarily, it can be if that's your flavor, but it's not necessarily devotion to another being. It's really devotion to this, this enlivening aspect of practice, this renewal to continue to seek, right? This is what we're doing when we're repeating the refuges and a chant as an example. Buddham Saranam Gachami. I go to the Buddha for refuge. Dhammam Saranam Gachami. 
I go to the Dhamma for refuge. Sangam Saranam Gachami. I go to the Sangha for refuge. It's not like it's an end place, but this repeating of phrases, this chanting, is reminding us to continue to seek, like, oh, is it possible? Is it possible to really trust that this heart knows how to be open, clear, expansive? That this heart knows how to feel the breath moving and not get confused by it? Like, oh, this isn't my breath. This is going to the Buddha for refuge is simply this acknowledgement, right? And much more, but that's one easy way that we can feel into going to the Buddha for refuge. Oh, this breath is not mine. Look at that. It has a life of its own. Oh, breath is connected with all forces of life, emotional, emotional realm, thoughts, interpersonal influences, how the breath is. Breath comes and goes. Simply. So going to the Buddha for refuge is this wide, expansive heart, going to the heart for refuge, going to the sensitive heart, trusting that the sensitive heart knows how to connect and knows how to connect with truths and deeper and deeper levels as we live into what it means to be human and be in this complex life that we're living, going to the Dhamma for refuge going to the Sangha for refuge, appreciating that there are other humans on this path, doing the same kind of seeking, imperfect, falling off, getting back, you know, just continuing to co-create, like never denying that we are participating together in something. This is this enlivening, renewing aspect of going to Sangha for refuge. Like, oh, we are always participating in some experience of belonging for ourselves and each other. We're always establishing in every moment what it means to be a community at common ground and elsewhere in the world. Whether we like it or not, you know, I could say, well, I'm not, I'm not really that interested in this community. And I could just pretend like I'm not participating. But just that decision is a participation, right? It's a kind of participation. So whether or not we like it, we are a force of karma. As much of a force of karma as we are a force of nature. And we're never going to get away from that. And so it really, it really will serve us well to honor like, oh yeah, every action, every intention bears some fruit, beneficial fruit or non-beneficial fruit, right? And how we enliven our practice moment by moment, day by day, year by year, is to care about that, to keep understanding that, deepen our understanding of that and keep asking the questions, well, what does that mean for me for now? What does that mean for me right now in this community, in this relationship? And so as Jason was talking about abolishing the need for police, he was actually talking about abolishing the need to be dependent on others to take care of us, to actually fully participate and and take responsibility for caring for each other in the ways that we can in all the ways that we can. And to me, that's right in line with the Buddhist teaching, the Buddhist teachings on Sangha, what it means to go to continuing to go to Sangha for refuge. One of the significant practices for Kitty Saro that 
and to Nisera, they speak about a lot and we're getting into in this book is this Kuan Yin chanting and Kuan Yin practices. And so the Kuan Yin is the embodiment of compassion and the This is a beautiful phrase, Kuan Yin. You might take it to mean she her she who hears the cry, she who gives her life to the uh, she she who hears the cries of the world, one interpretation, or another way of thinking about that is I give my life over fully to the one who hears the cries of the world, right? So that's this going, continuing to renew. I give my life fully to the one who hears the cries of the world. And this devotional aspect of renewing a deepening of our commitment to presence, but also this, I want to say purification. I know that's not the best word for lots of people, but you know, this like purifying our intentions and purifying our presence so that when we are participating, we're, we are contributing something beneficial, like deep compassion, deep kindness, deep love, not turning away from any of the difficulties in the world, but participating as we do with a really deep and loving heart. And Kitty Saro says this, During my year of silent retreat, Kuan Yin became a tangible presence. Every day I did a slow two-hour devotional practice called the Great Compassion Repentance Ceremony, which is centered on the vows of Kuan Yin. Master Hua assured me that this practice would help me overcome my illness and other karmic obstacles. He had typhoid fever for was sick for almost 10 years. As I deepened into this practice supported by all that I had learned from Ajahn Chah and Ajahn Sumedho, I entered a beautiful state, a depth of silence that revealed a timeless, trusting, intimate listening. This inner listening is considered the essence of Kuan Yin. Ultimately, Kuan Yin isn't Mahayana, Theravada, or even Buddhist. Kuan Yin is neither male nor female. The true spirit of Kuan Yin can manifest in any form needed to awaken, rescue, and pierce the hearts of living beings with compassion. In essence, Kuan Yin is a metaphor for the deepest heartbeat of the universe. A heart that is empty and yet filled with listening. A listening that is aware, merciful, proud, profoundly wise, and responsive. Through the practices centered on Kuan Yin, I discovered a deep sense of connection with all life. Ironically, even though I was silent, sitting alone in a tiny forest hut, I felt closer to my family, friends, and fellow community members than if I'd been sitting in a room with them. I discovered a prayerful dimension to my practice and plunged ever deeper into this mysterious Kuan Yin Dharma door the crux of which is merciful response emerging from emptiness. Now, I don't know about you, but that description is like, oh, the path of freedom, right? In this very intuitive way, connecting with the deep, this deep knowing, this deep understanding of emptiness balanced with the force of compassion, the force of love, right, right here that's available to us, even in a very simple moment. And so we might explore these, any ways to bring ritual into our practice could be just the beginning of a sit where we Get still and remember, you don't even have to know the refuges, the chant. You might just reflect just for a moment, like, oh, this heart that knows how to take refuge in Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, 
this heart that can connect and be sensitive to the way things are and trust that there's this interconnectedness of human beings through time that have been seeking. And it is something very simple. And just at the end of our end of a practice, you might just, you know, experiment with a bow or a nod even, or some kind of ritualistic ending, like a hand on the chest, the heart, closed eyes, like a surrender. Right? This life is so complicated and my life is complicated and your life is complicated and it's all really true. Let me just bow to that right now. And hopefully these, as Kitty Saro pointed out, these ways of bringing some devotional practice or which ritual and creative ways to inspire or enliven our practice also brings us closer to each other in creating what we want. how we want to be with each other. And I'm not sure how the world does that. I really don't know. But I do know that I feel responsible to you. And hopefully we feel responsible to each other. And if that's true, we get to figure that out moment by moment as our practice becomes more alive for each of us. It would be nice to hear from you all now, after I talked longer than I thought I would. But there's still time. So share your thoughts about anything, really. And especially if you have something to say about, you know, how you return to your deepest values any ways that you use devotion or ritual to help you reconnect be great to hear Um, sometimes if i don't sometimes i'm i might not intend to sit but i'll i'll just go into where my cushion is or where my altar is and i'll just pause there and just bow it's a just a way of reconnecting useful That's a nice way to end before I ask Patrice to dedicate the merit for us. So this is one of the the beautiful um, rituals that um, just really helps me feel connected, um, connected to um, my imagination, uh, connected to um, one of the paramis, generosity and uh, to really connect with kind of my deepest intention. So so if there are any benefits, blessings, goodness from our time together tonight, from our shared practice, from our sharing, if we could, we would gladly, happily, joyfully share it with others. In fact, completely give it away. We could give it to people we know and love. We could give it to people we don't know and maybe don't love. We can give it to people who are particularly suffering You could give it to the animals, the trees, the earth itself, wishing for all beings, no matter how large, how small, that everyone, 
everyone find a path to peace and goodness and ultimately freedom. May it be so. Thanks, Patrice. Thanks, Thanks everyone.